American life in the mid-1970s was troubling to say the least. While the U.S. had recently withdrawn from Vietnam, the social and political fallout from this incredibly unpopular war would linger for years to come. Meanwhile, the Nixon administration was being investigated for the Watergate scandal, bringing a new kind of disgrace to the Oval Office. On top of all this was a historic energy crisis, record levels of inflation, and economic recession. People were disillusioned with the American dream, losing faith in a system that seems to be failing them on every level. This was the unfortunate setting for the Bicentennial, America's 200th birthday that was quickly approaching on July 4th, 1976. While this was supposed to be a once-in-a-lifetime celebration on a national scale, few people were in a patriotic mood. It seemed the date would pass without much attention, until a group of ordinary people set out to create a celebration of their own. Now more than ever, America needed a reminder of its accomplishments, the incredible challenges it had overcome, and the values that had united its people for nearly 200 years. To fully understand the Bicentennial Project, we actually need to step back another 30 years. Japan's surrender to the United States on September 2, 1945, marked a victorious end to World War II. But this victory had ushered in a new kind of warfare, one that was both terrifying and morally questionable. Likewise, growing tensions with the Soviet Union were setting the stage for a new kind of enemy, the communist ideology. Americans were now finding themselves in a more complicated world. Some began to question the values of their democratic system, while others simply took it for granted. Seven months after the end of the war, an idea sparked that would aim to combat this problem. William Koblenz, with the U.S. Department of Justice, realized that most Americans would never have a chance to see their nation's greatest historic documents. If these could be put on a special train and brought around the country, Americans could feel a more tangible connection to their founding principles. The idea was brought to U.S. Attorney General Tom Clark, and then to President Harry Truman, who were both immediately on board. This idea soon developed into the Freedom Train, a traveling exhibit that would visit hundreds of cities in all 48 states. On board would be over 120 precious artifacts, including the Constitution, Bill of Rights, and Declaration of Independence. Leading the train would be a state-of-the-art diesel locomotive, developed by the American Locomotive Company and General Electric. While steam engines were still widely used at this time, diesels were quickly ushering in a new era of progress. The Alco PA-1 loaned to the Freedom Train was the first production unit of its kind, and would show off the latest in American diesel technology. The exhibits themselves were built inside three converted baggage cars, which were heavily armored inside and out. Each document was secured in high-grade acrylic, bulletproof glass, and steel casing. And for good measure, a security detail of U.S. Marines would live on the train, guarding the artifacts 24 hours a day. After more than a year of preparation, the national tour kicked off in Philadelphia on September 17, 1947. A key part of the experience in each city would be the Freedom Scroll, where visitors could sign their names to pledge their faith in American values. Also debuting at the ceremony was a new song, The Freedom Train, composed by Irving Berlin and performed by Bing Crosby and the Andrews Sisters. Here comes the freedom train, you'd better hurry down. Just like a Paul Revere's coming into your hometown. 
Over 33,000 people viewed the train in the first three days, with thousands more having to be turned away. And this was only the first of over 300 cities the train would visit over the next 16 months. In fact, the crowds would become a recurring problem. Only about 600 people could get through the exhibits per hour, creating a bottleneck for the thousands of people waiting in line. While the message of the Freedom Train was a noble one, it wasn't without its critics. President Truman and Attorney General Clark were known for their staunch anti-communist policies. This promoted a kind of blind patriotism that could be dangerous if left unchecked. The Freedom Train was a clear reflection of this, and many people accused it of being a literal propaganda machine. Despite this mixed reception, the attitude throughout the tour was generally very positive. By December, things were getting more tense as the train began touring the Deep South. Before the tour had started, the train's leaders discussed how they would handle the issue of racial segregation laws. It would be an obvious contradiction if black and white visitors were kept separate while viewing the documents that guaranteed their freedom. So it was agreed that the train would have a zero-tolerance policy towards segregation. Most cities throughout the South respected this rule, and black and white visitors stood side by side to reflect on their shared heritage. But issues soon arose in Birmingham, Alabama. City leaders, like Police Commissioner Eugene Bull Connor, vowed that they would never allow black and white visitors to see the train together. As a result, Birmingham was stricken from the itinerary and the train carried on without stopping. Local residents were angered by the city's stubborn convictions. In response, Mayor William Hartsfield of Atlanta, Georgia, invited them to his city instead, saying, In Atlanta, the Freedom Train will be open at all times to all persons regardless of race or creed. I do not see how anybody can draw a color line through freedom and justice. The following week, in January of 1948, similar problems arose in Memphis, Tennessee. Mayor James Pleasance insisted that segregation was necessary for public safety saying, With the inevitable jostling and pushing that must result, race trouble is sure to happen. It would be entirely avoided by dividing the time between white people and the colored, giving half to each. Unsurprisingly, the Memphis stop was cancelled as well. With the negative press surrounding both cities, the segregation rule was not challenged again after this point. On a lighter note, the Freedom Train had such a cultural impact that it was even featured in the June 1948 issue of Captain Marvel Adventures. In this thrilling story, the titular hero faced off against an evil scientist who vowed to take down the Freedom Train. This seems like it should have been a job for Captain America, though apparently his on and off girlfriend had recently become his sidekick, so he probably had his mind on other things. The train's final stop was in Washington DC in January of 1949. The tour had been a success, but it was also an interesting contradiction. It was panned by critics as propaganda, while at the same time shedding light on some of America's major shortcomings. In the span of nearly a year and a half, the Freedom Train covered over 37,000 miles, bringing the nation's most important documents to over 3.5 million people. As the next two decades came and went, memories of the Freedom Train faded away, and a new generation grew up unaware of its existence. This was even true for train buffs like Ross Rowland, a young Wall Street broker who took every chance he could get to swap his suit for engineer's overalls. At just 26 years old, he already had years of experience restoring and operating steam locomotives in his spare time. In 1966, I formed the High Iron Company, Incorporated, the purpose of which was to operate steam locomotive-powered public excursions on railroads in the greater northeast New York City area, pulling basically commuter cars on weekends and selling tickets to the public to pay the, pay the cost. The most ambitious of these trips would take place in May of 1969. To celebrate 100 years since the completion of the first transcontinental railroad, the group hosted the Golden Spike Centennial Limited. 
This long-distance public excursion ran from New York City to Promontory Summit, Utah. On the approach to Salt Lake City, the crew was joined by actor John Wayne. He and Ross Rowland had become friends in a past life, and he was excited to help promote the event. He was kind enough to arrange that year to, to premiere his big movie, True Grit. The night we arrived in Salt Lake City, he premiered the movie. And on the way into Salt Lake, John and I were standing in the observation car, and he was very impressed with the fact that every road crossing we went over, there were 50, 100, 200 people there waving flags and cheering, etc. And John said, you know, Ross, uh, seven years from now, we're going to celebrate our 200th birthday. Why don't we do a train like this, even better than this, um, and take it across the country to celebrate that anniversary. And then I said, okay, John, I tell you what, if you'll get the Hollywood crowd behind it, I'll do the heavy lifting and, and put it together. And he said, you got a deal, we shook hands. And that was the beginning of the Freedom Train project. After returning home, Rollins learned about the Freedom Train from the 1940s. The parallels with the modern era were clear as Americans were once again feeling confused and cynical about their country. What's more, the government wasn't planning any national celebrations for the bicentennial. Roland felt that if a special train could bring historic artifacts across the nation once again, this could be a perfect solution to both problems. He soon formed a nonprofit organization, the American Freedom Train Foundation, and spent a year in Washington, D.C. trying to convince politicians to fund the project. In retrospect, it was a total waste of time. And it became apparent to me that if the Freedom Train was going to happen, we were going to have to get corporate co-sponsors to, to pay for it because the government was never going to get their act together. Roland would spend the entirety of 1973 making his pitch to dozens of corporations. Meanwhile, members of the High Iron Company were tasked with finding a locomotive that could handle the job. While the industry had long since moved entirely to diesel, the crew knew from experience that a steam locomotive could draw the public's attention like nothing else. They considered several options, including Nickel Plate 759, which had been used on the Golden Spike trip, Norfolk and Western 611, which was on display at the Roanoke Transportation Museum, and Union Pacific 8444, which was being used for corporate publicity events. But the team had their eye on an unlikely candidate. Southern Pacific 4449. Built in 1941, this GS-class engine was designed for the Coast Daylight Service between San Francisco and Los Angeles. The streamlined design and bright colors of these locomotives made them instantly iconic. Sadly, nearly all of them would meet the scrapper's torch by the late 1950s. 4449 escaped this fate when it was moved up to Portland, Oregon to go on display in Oaks Park. Here it would sit for the next 15 years, exposed to the elements as a ghost of its former self. Bringing the sleeping giant back to life would be a perfect tribute for the American Freedom Train. However, the project still hadn't found any financial backing. By now Ross Rowland had made 54 corporate presentations, and got 54 rejections. But on the 55th day, the Lord shone his face upon the Pepsi-Cola company. The Lord was with, it, with us for sure because on the 55th presentation, uh, which I made on 23 December 1973 uh, to Pepsi-Cola, they said yes. Their chairman, Don Kendall, said to me that right after the holidays, I want you to keep your calendar open because I'm going to take you, you and I are going to go, and we're going to get the other four sponsors in a hurry. I said, yes, sir. And that's exactly what happened. In early 1974, Roland and Kendall made their pitch to General Motors, Kraft Foods, Prudential Insurance, and Arco. The CEOs of these companies just happened to be friends of Mr. Kendall, and practically overnight, the foundation had the $5 million it needed to launch the project. Volunteers headed to Portland to inspect the daylight engine in person. Despite its haggard appearance, the moving parts were in remarkably good condition. Meanwhile, in Richmond, California, crews began cutting up 10 retired baggage cars. These would soon be rebuilt to house the Freedom Train's interior exhibits. 
Two additional baggage cars were sent to Venice, Florida, to be converted into window display cars. Famous designer Barry Howard, based in Larchmont, New York, was selected to design the exhibits. The focal point would be hundreds of historic artifacts to showcase America's history and culture. Getting access to these items might have been a major challenge if it weren't for Don Kendall. After making a phone call to his close friend, President Nixon, the Foundation was given full access to the National Archives, Library of Congress, and Smithsonian Institution. In July, the Foundation launched the Preamble Express. This was a train of specialists that would travel the country to plan out the route for the official tour. Their press kit for local officials included a new promotional song, Here Comes the Freedom Train, performed by Porter Wagoner and Dolly Parton. All aboard America, here comes the Freedom Train. All aboard America, here comes the Freedom Train. In mid-December, with the city of Portland's blessing, volunteers carefully pulled Engine 4449 out of Oaks Park. Four days later, in Alexandria, Virginia, President Gerald Ford inaugurated the upcoming tour from the rear platform of the Preamble Express. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Obviously, I'm tremendously pleased to participate in the official ceremony recognizing the American Freedom Train as a major bicentennial effort. Similar to its predecessor, the train would make stops in all 48 contiguous states. But this tour would be quite a bit longer, spanning nearly two years from April 1975 to the end of 1976. This meant the team only had about three more months to get everything ready for opening day and there was a staggering amount of work that still lay ahead. Although the crew was experienced in steam engine restoration, the task ahead of them was enormous. This engine was larger than anything they had worked on before, and it had to be completely restored and ready to go in about 90 days. To meet this tight deadline, the crew worked 18 hours a day, not even stopping for Christmas Day 1974 or New Year's Day 1975. Volunteers flocked in from all over the country to lend a hand with the project. Among them was 31-year-old Doyle McCormick from Konya, Ohio. He was experienced in operating steam and diesel engines alike, and had actually been the engineer on the Golden Spike trip in 1969. McCormick became a key member of the Daylight Engines crew, and was soon chosen to be its engineer for the national tour. Meanwhile, in Chicago, Pittsburgh, and Alexandria, the artifacts and displays were being installed in the exhibit cars. The curation team, led by Ruth Packard, had made great headway in acquiring hundreds of artifacts to help tell the American story. Where do you go to find 200 years of American history? We took a trained staff to comb the entire country. We talked to thousands of people in museums, institutions, as well as many private collectors. We finally narrowed it down so that the 10 exhibit cars would contain 512 artifacts and documents from 285 lenders in 110 cities. It's a real challenge. The cars were equipped with a moving walkway that would carry visitors through the exhibits. While the original Freedom Train had allowed people to walk through at their own pace, this walkway would allow twice as many people to get through the exhibits per day. You might want to stand next to those items for three, four, five minutes absorbing them, right? Well. If you did that, everybody behind you has to wait till you're ready to move before they can move because it's single file. <laughs> so with the moving walkway, we knew from an 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. display day, we could get 16,000 people through the train. And that's how we knew how many advanced tickets we could sell. As each guest entered, they would be handed a personal listening wand to hear narration and sounds that were synchronized with the visual displays. This was not a simple museum, but a true multimedia experience, 
with each car exploring a different facet of American culture. Car 1 portrayed the earliest beginnings of the nation in the 1700s. This included weapons from the Revolutionary War, George Washington's copy of the Constitution, and a copy of Poor Richard's Almanac from 1756. Car 2 showed exploration and expansion throughout the ages. Displayed here were cultural artifacts from Native American tribes, the original Louisiana Purchase, and a moon rock from one of the Apollo missions. Car 3 was a visual mosaic of change and growth over 200 years. Images showed the progress from frontier settlements to bustling cities, from horse-drawn wagons to modern jets. Car 4 was about America's melting pot, a nation of immigrants from all corners of the globe. In one of the more impressive features, mannequins with video-projected faces spoke about their cultural experiences. Car 5 was a celebration of American ingenuity. Examples of patented inventions were displayed here, from the earliest telephones and sewing machines to Thomas Edison's first incandescent lamp. Car 6 showed the skilled professions of American workers. Among the artifacts here were the original manuscript for the Battle Hymn of the Republic and Thomas Paine's 1776 edition of Common Sense. Car 7 was filled with American sports memorabilia. This included Bob Lanier's size 20 basketball shoes, Joe Frazier's boxing gloves, and baseball bats used by Lou Gehrig, Joe DiMaggio, and Hank Aaron. Car 8 was a celebration of the performing arts. Items here included Charlton Heston's staff from the Ten Commandments, Alfred Hitchcock's director's chair, and one of Judy Garland's dresses from The Wizard of Oz. Car 9 was dedicated to the fine arts. This was an impressive collection of paintings and sculptures, with the most famous being Archibald Willard's painting, The Spirit of 76. Car 10 honored major points of conflict in American history. This included an early draft of the Emancipation Proclamation, Franklin D. Roosevelt's declaration of war against Japan, and Dr. Martin Luther King's Bible investments. From outside the train, visitors could view two additional showcase cars containing larger items. Among these were a double-sized replica of the Liberty Bell, a 1904 Oldsmobile that won the first transcontinental auto race, and a 19th century fire engine. By the end of February, restoration on the steam engine was making good progress, despite some setbacks along the way. But just as things were looking up, there was a major snag. Because of the engine's sheer size and weight, it couldn't be used on the older tracks in the Northeast states. With the tour set to begin in five weeks, the Foundation agreed to use a diesel locomotive for this part of the country instead. But Ross Rowland was determined to find a lighter steam engine that could handle the job. His search took him to a junkyard in Baltimore, where he found the remnants of two Reading T1 locomotives, numbers 2100 and 2101. Between them were enough parts to make one of these engines functional, so Rowland purchased them immediately. While the crew in Portland had proven that a major restoration could theoretically be done in three months, Roland's crew in Baltimore would have to pull it off in just 30 days. The engine selected for restoration was number 2101, which was built for the Reading Railroad in 1945. Throughout its career, it handled everything from passenger service to heavy coal trains, offering impressive strength for its size. The engine was retired in 1959, and would ultimately sit in the weeds rusting away for over a decade. Despite the seemingly impossible deadline, volunteers scrambled to restore the engine to its former glory. The roundhouse was bustling 24 hours a day, with up to 100 people working on the engine at any given time. With only a few weeks to go, the completed cars of the Freedom Train were assembled in Alexandria. Half of the train contained equipment and facilities for the crew, while the other half contained the exhibits themselves. On March 28th, time had finally run out. The Freedom Train needed to get on the road to prepare for its opening day. Just as a diesel was starting to pull the train out of the yard, Ross Rowland and his crew came around the corner in a cloud of steam. Against all odds, they had pulled off the 30-day miracle. The engine was gleaming like new, with its paint barely dry, and a new number, number one, which it would carry for the duration of the tour. Roland himself had been absorbed with the restoration for the last month, and was just now seeing the completed train for the first time. After years of painstaking work, his vision had finally become a reality. The American Freedom Train was ready to begin its incredible journey.
On April 1, 1975, the American Freedom Train officially kicked off its tour in Wilmington, Delaware. By the time the exhibit opened at 8 o'clock in the morning, the line was already three miles long. 70,000 people would tour the train during its four-day stop here, giving hope to the idea that many Americans still had pride in their country. I thought it was fantastic. It's a very great thing for the American people to be able to see all the diversity of all of the cultures, not only of my people, but of all the different people. I like the, the, board, the mannequins that talked. I thought that was really unusual. Um, I like the baseball players. Freedom Bell. The sports. Setting off from Wilmington, the train spent the next month and a half running through upstate New York and parts of New England. Tour stops here included Burlington, Vermont, Manchester, New Hampshire, Portland, Maine, Boston, Massachusetts, and Rochester, New York. Most cities along the route didn't have big museums with these kinds of modern displays and famous artifacts. For most Americans, the Freedom Train was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to see these items together, especially so close to home. I really love to hear the comments of the people as they come off the train. It makes it all seem so worthwhile. There's something on there for everyone, there really is. And you hear them talking about George Washington's copy of the Constitution, the Moon Rocks, the Louisiana Purchase, the real one. Willard's painting of the Spirit of 76. The invention car is so popular, Bob Lanier's sneaker. We have put together a collection that's unforgettable that people will not ha ever again have a chance to see in one plate. While the reception was largely positive, the moving walkway was already getting some complaints. Visitors were waiting hours to get inside the train, only to be whisked through the exhibits in about 15 minutes. They wanted to view things at their own pace, but the moving walkway was necessary if the project had any hope of breaking even. It was by far our biggest single complaint item from the 21-month tour, without doubt, without a doubt. And, and it's understandable, and the criticism was valid, but the alternative was not to have a moving walkway and, and have no idea how many people you could put through the train. The revenue was critical to make it work financially, so the moving walkway was mandatory, it wasn't optional. The crew slowed down the walkway in response to the feedback, extending the experience to about 22 minutes. However, these complaints would persist through the entire tour. The train pushed onward to Ohio, with multiple stops here including Cleveland and Columbus. After leaving the state, its next stop was in Fort Wayne, Indiana. The train was originally planned to go down to Indianapolis, but city officials couldn't come to an agreement on the cost, so this stop never happened. Instead the train made its way up to Detroit, Michigan, where it would go on display for the next two weeks. Meanwhile, back in Oregon, the restoration of the daylight engine was finally completed. Since the first leg of the tour was being handled by engine number one, the Portland crew had more time to finish their work. Engine 4449 was now fully restored and steaming like new, complete with a special patriotic paint scheme. Now it was ready to head out to Chicago, where it would take over the Freedom Train later in the summer. This solo trip would take nearly two weeks in itself, as the engine would make numerous stops for crowds of excited fans. Leaving Portland, the engine made its way south, taking a long detour through Northern California and eventually reaching Sacramento. From here it turned east, passing through Reno and Sparks, Nevada, Ogden, Utah, Denver, Colorado, and Lincoln, Nebraska. The final stop was General Motors' EMD plant in LaGrange, Illinois. This would be the engine's temporary home for the next month while it waited for the Freedom Train to arrive in Chicago. While all this was going on, the Foundation's president, John Faust, suddenly resigned without any public explanation. Uh, we had a president who proved to be very unpopular with a vast majority of the employees, so there was a minor rebellion to get rid of him, and, and it finally boiled over to the point that the sponsors agreed, and, and our board of directors fired him and hired a new guy by the name of Peter Sperney, who turned out to be a much better leader. Peter Sperney would prove to be an excellent choice. He was experienced in turning around financially struggling ventures, 
including the recent Expo 74 in Spokane, Washington. This skill set would help the Freedom Train stay afloat financially throughout the tour. Kids, families, people, that's what the Bicentennial is all about. And I can't tell you how thrilling and exciting it is to be taking America's heritage to these people. The train's a huge success. It was built through donations, and its operation costs are covered by ticket sales. We're just overwhelmed with the response. After the long layover in Detroit, the Freedom Train made a few more stops in Michigan and Indiana, before heading into central Illinois, eventually reaching its next major stop in Chicago. On August 4th, Engine 4449 moved into the city to meet the Freedom Train, where the torch was passed in a special nose-to-nose -nose ceremony. Engine number one was relieved of its duties for the time being, and soon took its place in the LaGrange engine shops. The two engines would meet again down the line, but for now it was finally time for 4449 to take the national spotlight. For the next several months, engineer Doyle McCormick would be at the throttle of the Freedom Train as it toured the western United States. Along for the ride was his wife Lori, who was getting her first experience seeing the country outside of her home state of Ohio. Joining them was Doyle's 73-year-old father, Roy, also known as Pop, a retired railroad man who would be the oldest member of the crew. One of the most thrilling experiences of the whole adventure is to be on the locomotive as you're going across the country and see the thousands upon thousands of people that come down to track sign in small towns and big cities everywhere. Some places we go through, there are thousands of people there. As you can see, school buses lined up for a mile down the road, and the kids all lined up trackside. Some of them probably will never get to see the inside of it, but they still felt the experience of the train as it passed. Leaving Chicago, the train made a few more stops in northern Illinois before heading up to Wisconsin. Milwaukee was the second city to decline because of the cost, so the next stop was in Green Bay instead. From here the train spent the next month crisscrossing the Midwest, with stops including Minneapolis, Minnesota, Fargo, North Dakota, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and West Des Moines, Iowa. On the approach to Omaha, Nebraska, it was scheduled to pick up some local officials and members of the press. Much to their surprise, the train continued right past them, as no one had informed Engineer McCormick about the extra stop. This mistake was quickly corrected, but several months later, it would become the humorous setting for an Archie comic strip. During the tour stop in Omaha, the engine was found to have a mechanical issue, so it had to be sidelined here until this was fixed. In the meantime, the Freedom Train would be led by two Burlington Northern diesels, numbers 1776 and 1876, which were decked out in bicentennial paint schemes of their own. The tour continued on schedule to the next state of Colorado. Denver had passed on the opportunity as well, so the train went on display in Colorado Springs. While public reception had mostly stayed positive, the last several tour stops had seen small groups of people boycotting the Freedom Train. These groups were part of the People's Bicentennial Commission, a grassroots movement that was protesting the Bicentennial as a whole. They felt the government was over-commercializing the whole event, and accused the Freedom Train of being a corporate cash grab. And we had enemies, there were, there were different fringe groups that were anti-freedom train because they were anti-war and they felt the freedom train was promoting the war, which it wasn't. And they felt it was a corporate cop-out, which it wasn't. So we had our share of enemies, you know, which you'll always have. I mean, that's part of the free society and that's part of freedom. <laughs> Heading out of Colorado, the tour continued north to Cheyenne, Wyoming and Billings, Montana. Meanwhile, back in Omaha, the repairs to the daylight engine were completed. By coincidence, Union Pacific 8444 was also being serviced here, and was getting ready to head back to its home base in Cheyenne. As a result, the two engines were sent west together, double-heading a 500-mile excursion from Omaha to Cheyenne. After this, the daylight continued further west on its own, finally catching up and resuming the tour in Salt Lake City, Utah. 
From here it was a long trek north, with stops in Boise, Idaho and Spokane, Washington, before eventually crossing over to Seattle. During this stop, the tour was met by a fellow steam engine, Canadian Royal Hudson No. 2860. This was leading a special excursion of its own, bringing over 700 visitors from British Columbia to see the Freedom Train. After Seattle, the tour continued through Washington and down into Portland, Oregon. And the engine, of course, is old 4449, loaned by the city of Portland to make a 20-month journey around the United States as part of the bicentennial celebration. There are 25 cars in the Freedom Train, 10 are display cars, each with a different theme. There are two showcase cars featuring early modes of transportation, the Lunar Rover, and a huge Freedom Bell. As it crosses America, with its sampling of heritage and history, the train is a most impressive sight. From here, the train made two more stops in Oregon before heading south to California. After making a detour to Reno and Sparks, Nevada, it made several stops throughout Northern California, eventually going on display in San Francisco. Soon after, it left the Bay Area, heading down through the Central Valley and eventually reaching Southern California. Los Angeles was another city to decline the Freedom Train, so the next stop would be slightly east in Pomona. Here the tour would spend Christmas week at the LA County Fairgrounds. On December 31st, the train moved to Santa Barbara to prepare for its next display stop. 1975 had finally drawn to a close, and the crew reflected on their progress. They had traveled over 11,000 miles, visiting over 50 cities in the span of nine months. And yet there was still another full year of traveling that lay ahead. With the dawn of the new year, 1976, America's bicentennial was slowly drawing near. But by this point in the tour, with another 12 months to go, the crew was feeling severe burnout. They were working seven days a week to put on this show for tens of thousands of people. And every few days, they had to pick up and move to a new city to do it all over again. It took approximately 85 people to moved the train through the country. The vast majority of them were very young people, um, either just out of college or still in college. And it was hard duty. You were required to live out of a suitcase. Almost all of the staff were put in motels. They did not live on the train. Um, and it was demanding because of all the sold out crowds. So it was, it was not an easy gig. With the demands of the job, employee turnover was quite high. New faces often joined in one city and then dropped off somewhere else down the line. Despite the challenges, the crew found ways to keep their spirits up. Doyle and Lori McCormick had brought their St. Bernard, Samantha, and at some point the crew had adopted a tabby kitten named Daylight. Other members of the crew found different forms of companionship instead. For example, PR coordinator Michelle Watson hit it off with Army Major Don McCormick and security, and now they were getting married. Speaking about life on the road, she said, There are quite a few shipboard romances that occur. Well, there are a lot that last for a day or two, anyway. You get 140 people, most of them young, single, and, well, you know. Anything else I would say about it would be cheap gossip. While the Freedom Train was touring Southern California, Engine number one came out of storage in LaGrange, Illinois. It was scheduled to get an overhaul at the Southern Railway's steam shops in Birmingham, Alabama, and soon made a long solo trip down south. The engine would remain in Birmingham for the next few months, with the plan to take over the Freedom Train once it arrived here in the spring. Back in California, the Freedom Train was hitting a snag as it prepared to leave Santa Barbara. The two showcase cars had somehow gotten switched around in the opposite order. This generally didn't matter, but a local railroad official refused to let the train leave until they were switched back. As crewman Stephen Bush later recalled, This would be a switching nightmare, a real hassle and delay the departure, but he didn't care. So someone on the crew found a ladder and a can of paint, 
And that night, car number 40 became number 41, and number 41 was reborn as number 40. That was enough to satisfy the local official, and the two cars stayed in that order for the duration of the tour. With the issue sorted, the Freedom Train continued its tour of Southern California, with stops including Anaheim and San Diego. From here it left the west coast, and headed eastward to Arizona. During the tour stop in Tempe, visitors got to enjoy a benefit concert by Johnny Cash and June Carter Cash. Johnny Cash had actually been involved in the Freedom Train project early on, and had helped shoot a commercial to build excitement across the country. Hello, I'm Johnny Cash. You know, we the people have something to cheer about. America's 200th birthday, the Bicentennial. To help celebrate, the American Freedom Train is coming your way, drawn by a giant steam locomotive. At the next stop in Tucson, the train crossed paths with another major project, the Bicentennial Wagon Train Pilgrimage. Hundreds of people across the country were tracing historic pioneer routes in covered wagons with the plan to converge at Valley Forge, Pennsylvania on July 4th. While the Freedom Train was the nation's largest bicentennial event, the Wagon Train pilgrimage was a notable achievement in its own right. Moving out of Arizona, the train pushed on to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Odessa and Midland, Texas. Meanwhile, a local group in Texas had been restoring a steam engine of their own, Texas and Pacific No. 610. Arrangements were made for this engine to pull the Freedom Train through Texas. It was supposed to take over during the Odessa Midland stop, but due to some delays, it didn't catch up with the tour until Austin. From here, number 610 led the Freedom Train for the next two and a half weeks, running down to Houston and then up to Fort Worth and Dallas. After this, the daylight resumed its duties, and the tour continued northward. Over the next few weeks, the train visited numerous cities including Oklahoma City, Wichita, Kansas, St. Louis, Missouri, and North Little Rock, Arkansas. As it dipped down through the southern states, the stops included Memphis, Tennessee, Jackson, Mississippi, New Orleans, Louisiana, and Atlanta, Georgia. As the train reached Birmingham, it was finally reunited with engine number one. Once again, the locomotives were swapped now with 4449 taking an extended break for maintenance. With number one in the lead again, the train hit several more cities on its way back up to the northeast. Stops here included Chattanooga, Tennessee, Lexington, Kentucky, South Charleston, West Virginia, and Cumberland, Maryland. As July finally arrived, the train reached Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where it would spend the next few days for the Bicentennial on July 4th. This special stop had originally been planned for Philadelphia, but the city had apparently passed on the opportunity. The festivities in Harrisburg may have been on a smaller scale, but local crowds were incredibly supportive regardless. Hey, hey, this is fantastic. I think it's uh, one of the best things that could happen for the Bass Centennial. Oh, we liked it real well. Yeah. Kids were really interested. They found a lot of stuff they really enjoyed. Uh, it really brings to mind what we have and how precious what we have should be to us. Amidst parades and fireworks, the Freedom Train celebrated a major milestone in its journey. But there were nearly six more months of celebration before that journey would reach its conclusion. While there was still half a year to go, the end of the tour was starting to feel within reach. The crew was still exhausted, but they began to reflect on their journey knowing it would soon come to an end. As security guard Robin Meehan put it, When it's over, we'll begin to realize just what a great opportunity it was. We've seen the whole United States, an opportunity most people don't get in an entire lifetime. After departing Harrisburg, the train spent the next few weeks visiting several more cities, including Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and Morristown, New Jersey. With space being tight in the boroughs of New York City, the only place that could accommodate the train was Elmont on Long Island. After spending about a week here, the tour continued north, with stops including Providence, Rhode Island and Meriden, Connecticut. Over the next month, the tour worked its way south, with stops including Newark, New Jersey, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, Baltimore, Maryland, and Washington, D.C. 
Meanwhile, down in Birmingham, maintenance on the Daylight Engine had finished, and it was now ready to lead the tour once again. After making a short jaunt to Atlanta, the engine led a public excursion for the Southern Railway, traveling for two days up the East Coast to Alexandria. Once it arrived in DC, the engines were swapped for the third and final time. Number 1 was officially relieved of its duties, while 4449 would handle the remaining leg of the tour. The Freedom Train spent the next several weeks working its way down the East Coast. Stops here included Richmond, Virginia, Charlotte, North Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina, and Savannah, Georgia. Finally it reached Florida, the last state of the tour. The train visited several cities across the state, including Jacksonville, Orlando, and St. Petersburg, before reaching its final destination of Miami. I liked all of it. I think it's so well put together. And what I'm surprised about is how they collected so many different things for it. I think it's uh, terrific for the family to see something like this. It shows them what our heritage is. Uh, and helps us to be more thankful for the things that we have today. Thanks, one of the greatest things has come to our town. Emotions were high among the crew, as they felt a mix of relief and sadness as they prepared to go their separate ways. While they had spent almost two years bringing a positive message to America, America had shown them something too. As PR assistant Gloria Bonneville put it, The greatest thing that I have seen, and the biggest surprise throughout the trip, has been the enthusiasm of the people who have come to see the train. They really believe in what this country's all about. It's really a nice feeling. It's nice to see that people haven't forgotten. Even Pop McCormick had grown from the experience, saying, I'd begun to get a pessimistic view of this country. After traveling around the country on the train and meeting thousands upon thousands of nice people, this has changed my outlook to the optimistic side very strongly. On December 31, 1976, the last of nearly 7 million Americans viewed the train's exhibits. After traveling 25,833 miles, the greatest bicentennial event had finally reached the end of the line. As everyone parted ways the next morning, there were now several loose ends to tie up. Within a few days, the train cars were hauled back to Alexandria to offload the historic artifacts. Despite being on the road for nearly two years, the artifacts were returned to their owners in pristine condition. As for the exhibit cars themselves, the Foundation planned to sell them to pay off the remaining debts from the tour. In July, the National Museums of Canada agreed to take ownership of the cars for a new project called the Discovery Train. This would be a traveling showcase of history and culture that would visit cities all across Canada. The Discovery Train's tour took place from 1978 to 1980, and was a national success in its own right. Shortly after the Freedom Train's conclusion, engine number 2101 found a new contract with the Chessie system. The company was planning a series of excursions to celebrate the 150th anniversary of their predecessor, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. 2101 was soon painted in Chessie system colors, and spent a good portion of 1977 touring the Northeast and Midwest. The Chessie Steam Special was so successful that the engine was called back for a second season of trips in 1978. In the following winter, the engine was stored at the Stevens Yard Roundhouse in Silver Grove, Kentucky. Unfortunately, a major fire soon burned the roundhouse to the ground, and number 2101 would never run again. It was restored cosmetically to its Freedom Train appearance, and it was donated to the BNO Railroad Museum in Baltimore, where it remains to this day. After wrapping things up in Miami, Doyle McCormick now had to return the Daylight Engine to its owner, the city of Portland. To help pay its way home, the engine led two public excursions for Amtrak, covering about 4,500 miles on its journey from Florida to Oregon. After this point, the engine's future was unclear. Local enthusiasts wanted to create a new museum to display it, but the engine would ultimately go into storage for the next four years. Fortunately, starting in 1981, the engine began making excursions and special appearances around the country. 
Its celebrity status was boosted in 1986, when it traveled to Hollywood to star in the action comedy film Tough Guys. Following the September 11th terrorist attacks, the engine led a memorial excursion through Oregon, reprising its Freedom Train appearance for the first time in over 20 years. In 2012, the engine was finally given a proper home at the Oregon Rail Heritage Center. The museum houses a small but impressive collection of locomotives and equipment. 4449 is of course the crown jewel of the collection, and Doyle McCormick continues to be one of its primary caretakers. While opportunities for running the engine have dwindled in recent years, it remains in operational condition to this day. In the years since the Freedom Train's journey, many of the crew members have made it a priority to stay in touch. Every two years since the conclusion of the train in 1976, the, the crew uh, has had a reunion every second year in one of the 138 cities that we displayed in. To me, it's, it's, a, it's a telling uh, fact that still at the average reunion, somewhere between 40 and 75 of the crew still show up 40 some years later. Ross Rowland himself continues to be a respected member of the railroading community. Over the years, he's channeled his ambitions into numerous other ventures, though none have been quite as successful as the Bicentennial Project. Now he's looking ahead to America's 250th birthday in 2026, and hopes to revive the Freedom Train for a new generation. It'll be basically a, a clone, very much a clone, or a sequel. Uh, to the Bicentennial Train with some improvements from the many lessons we learned from doing that one. In today's climate, uh, because our country is so siloed, so divided on so many issues that, that, that uh, given a chance to come out and celebrate all of the great things we've been able to accomplish in our 250 years, despite our differences, um, I think the the overwhelming majority of our 330 million people will look upon that as a welcome change. Roland hopes to gain support from Washington and corporate sponsors to get the project off the ground. Whether he can pull it off remains to be seen, but he's in the rare position to say he's done it once before. Even if the Freedom Train never rides again, its legacy lives on in the memories of those who experienced it. It managed to bring Americans together at a most unlikely time, and in a wholly unique way. And in the process, it told the classic story of America itself, of ordinary people coming together to achieve extraordinary things.